not uh, be with you uh, all the way through from the beginning until the end because I'm, I'm, I'm driving somewhere now. But I, I, I think uh, definitely I will rewatch uh, the webinar uh, later on because I asked Ajahn Chilip here, my associate dean, to record this webinar if you allow us to do so. And also some of my students here, frankly, uh, I, 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 I would like to let our speaker know that they, they are very meant up something. They, they, not have, they, don't, they don't have enough uh, or adequate knowledge of linguistic corpus. So uh, Ajahn Onsili, Ajahn Lord Sumon also very meant up about <laughs> linguistic corpus. So I think it's a good thing for them to rewatch the record webinar uh, made by Ajahn uh, Chirimkir. Thank you so much, Ajahn Chirimkir, for doing this for us. All right, so I don't want to waste your time. I want you to meet our well-known speaker from Thammasan University. On behalf of Bay you once again, our uh, president, and I am the dean and the chair of this program. Uh, I would like to thank you very so much, our academic partner from different universities. And last but not least, I would like to invite all of you, please join me in giving a big hand of our, uh, our from our hearts to uh, our guest speaker today, Associate Professor Dr. Subhakorn Pujaran Sin. Thank you very so much, Ajahn Dr. Subhakorn Kap. Thank you. Now, thank, you very, now, thank you very much. For, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Right. So I'm so excited today, even though I'm, I'm going to give, you know, an online talk. Right. And thank you, Ajahn Akarapong, Ajahn Akarapong, for inviting me again. Actually, uh, we are partners, right? We are academic partners. We have an MOU between BRU and uh, Language Institute of Thammasat University, or LIT2. Right. So thank you. Thank you for uh, your, invita your kind invitation. Actually, you know, I got to know Dr. Akrapun the first time in 2014 and also Ajahn Kampira Park at the same at that time. Right. Yeah, I was invited. Right. Uh, to give a talk right on one Saturday, I think. Right. Yeah. For for teachers, right, high school teachers in Buriram, right, hosted by BRU, right, Buriram Rajapat University at that time. So, you know, I was honored to, to meet uh, all the professors there and, you know, the students, right, some of the students, some of the graduate students at that time has later on become uh, university lecturers, right. So, uh, all right, so, to, so, so sorry yeah, for in, interrupting. Uh, before we kick off the, the webinar, let right. me introduce you uh, to other participants ah, who joined sure. this webinar. Sure, Ajahn <laughs> sure. Ajahn. <Okay>. Right, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, the topic of this webinar is Corpus Linguistics, how can be applied to ELT and research work by the guest speaker from uh, Language Institute Thomas Art University. So let me uh, give you some... Uh, A brief right, about the the, the get like the guest lecturer today. Uh, we've got uh, assist, associate professor Dr. Subhakar Putaran uh, from Language Institute, Thammasat University. He is an uh, editor of Learn Journal, and he's got educational background from Chuaronggon um, University, both uh, BA second class honors in English, MA in English, and also PhD in English as an international language to Rangkong University also. Um, his in, uh, areas of interest are language, sorry, SLA or second language acquisition, interlanguage syntax and pragmatics, error analysis, combat linguistics and so on. Okay, all right, now uh, I think we are ready to gain our knowledge from the guest speaker today. So may I invite uh, the guest speaker, please. Thank you, Kap. Right, thank you very much, Kap. So I, I think there are eight PhD students, right, uh, belonging to second batch, right? And you know, some are, are students from the first batch joining us, right? So uh, as Ajahn Akrapong, Ajahn Akrapong uh, earlier mentioned, some of the students might might be uh, new, right, to corpus linguistics. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to assume that all of you uh, haven't uh, known corpus linguistics. So, you know, my my uh, talk today will touch upon the basic things in corpus linguistics, right? Uh, not too theoretical, but I'm going to present you something practical so that you can apply, uh, you know, what we're discussing today to your teaching and sometimes your research, right? Uh, let me share the screen. Actually, you know, I I gave 
uh, the PowerPoint to Ajat Akra Pun, right? And also, uh, there, there, are, <coughs> there is one uh, PowerPoint, right? Uh, slide and also, you know, uh, some materials, right? So you can see my screen, right? Okay, Kav. So let me begin. Okay, right. Ajahn <clears throat> Akharapun uh, Kaili gave me the topic, right? Compass so linguistics, how can it be applied to ELT? Which is very good, right? I, I really love this topic, right? Uh, because, you know, when you actually Corpus linguistic is a is a linguistic science right that can be applied to research teaching right and language studies okay so that's why you know uh, when when we talk when we talk about corpus linguistic many people uh, are likely to talk about how we can apply it to english language teaching right okay so uh, let's start with this. I believe that almost all of you are teachers, right? Maybe you are teaching somewhere. You are teaching at university levels. Some of you are high school teachers. I don't know, right? But, you know, because you are joining ELT program, right? So I, I believe that your, your interests concern uh, English language teaching in one way or another, right? So uh, you, this might be part of your experience. Right, there are some problems in ELT, right? That maybe we don't know how to find answers for our students, right? I'm quite sure that there are many students coming to ask you some, you know, question like this that are very challenging, right? For example, Ajahn Krab, you know, in Thai we say Kha or Krab, right? Ajahn Krab, uh, which word is more appropriate for academic writing? Perhaps, or maybe, what do you think? Which one do you think is more appropriate? They, they, they are synonymous, right? They have very similar meaning, but you know, in academic writing, which one is more appropriate? What do you think? You can perhaps, join me. Perhaps. Okay, as I wrote someone said, perhaps, yes. right, perhaps. Okay, what else? Perhaps. Okay, as I honestly said, perhaps, right, okay. Uh, how do you know that perhaps is more appropriate uh, for academic writing than maybe? How? Well, my father will sir, it normally seen in like academic uh, writing more than uh, the word maybe. Uh, okay, so from your experience, right, it's more, it's more frequent in academic writing, okay? Or maybe you know some of you might might say that because maybe it's more common in spoken English, right? Yeah, yes, that's why you assume it the other way around. You you claim that okay, maybe perhaps should be more appropriate in academic writing, right? But you know this is just based on your own uh, assumption, right? Your own experience as a language user or as a language uh, teacher, right? But you know. Uh, you can see that when, when you provide your students with answer, this is based on your own common sense, or uh, I would say <clears throat> uh, intuition, right? Yeah, intuition, I-N-T-U-I-T-I-O-N. Intuition is like the common sense of language users, right? Okay, how about these three synonyms, right? Result, outcome, and consequence. Again, they are synonyms, but how are they differently used, right? Any idea? Right, maybe, you know, um, these three words are very close in meaning, but you know, when you write or when you speak English, right, it's quite difficult to choose which word is the best in that particular context. And again, you might refer to your language experience, your exposure, the more exposure you have, the better uh, assumption would be Right. So again, right. But but you know, uh, when you when you share your experience with your students, right? Some sometimes you know when I was very young, when I was at high school, I asked my teachers, Ajahn, why you know when, when we are doing some exercise on uh, word choice or synonyms, right? We ask Ajahn, why is in this context we have to choose big uh, outcome rather than consequence, but in another context. Consequent is better than outcome, but not result, something like that, right? So the teacher said, uh, I don't know, right? My, my teachers who are Thai and they speak also 
they also speak L1 Thai. They say, Supercon, if you have been using language a lot, like me, you will know which one is right, which one is wrong. But you know, the answer like that doesn't help much, right? Because you know, the student cannot wait, right? So today we are going to find some solutions to that, right? All here, if clauses, I am quite sure that you, you know, all uh, teach English conditionals or if clauses, right? Uh, there are three main types, right? But actually, what there are also some other types. Can you think of any other types apart from types one, two, and three? Remember when you were students, or actually right now, I believe that many of you are teaching uh, grammar, right? And you introduce the three main types of English conditionals or if courses to your students, right? And you know, based on the grammar references that you use, right? There are three main types. But actually, only teaching only three main types might not be sufficient, right? And might not be very useful to your students, right? Because there are many other types. Uh, what, what are other types? What are some other types that you can think of? Um, zero, zero. Zero, very good. Okay, what is zero? It's like a talk about the current event that we can use uh, uh, both uh, clauses of the simple present tense. Okay, very good. So if you, if you talk about the form, the present tense is used in both main clause and uh, subordinate clause, right? In, in, in if clause and the main clause, right? And we, we use that to talk about something that is a general truth or a fact, scientific fact, very good, right? We call it zero, right? You know, actually the, the term zero is a new term. No, not, not that new, but you know, it has been used yeah, I think in 20 years, right? In, in just, you know, it, it has just been introduced in the past 20 years because, you know, 30, 35 years ago, right? When I was young, uh, I studied zero, but my teacher just called it subtype of type one, right? Yeah, and you know, it was got focused a lot in in language textbook, but you know, fortunately, I had a chance to learn zero even though I at that time it was not called zero, I, I know I know that it exists. And you know, apart from these four types, right, there are also mixed types, right? So you know, uh, life is not that easy. Life is not that simple as you might uh, speculate, right? So there are some other types that uh, you might not be familiar with, right? Okay. And you know, of all the three main types, which type is the most frequent? Can you guess? Okay, type the, one, type two, the, or type yeah. three? The first one. Type one. Okay, yeah. you say type one, maybe you are right, right. Okay, right, we talk about that later on. I, I'm going to share with you the research results from my study, right. Uh, another question, right. Have you ever taught relative pronoun whose? They thought, they have. Uh, you know, when it comes to relative clause, right, we think of who, right? What are other relative pronouns that you have been teaching? Who? Which? Which? Um, whom? That. That? Okay. Some, some might also include when, where, and why, right? But, you know, uh, syntactically speaking, they function like those of adverbs. So, you know, for some grammarians, they are called relative adverbs. But, okay, you know, it's not our job today to classify them. Uh, talking about whose. Uh, whose is quite difficult to use, right? Because, you know, when we use whose, uh, whose is like, it, fun it functions like uh, an adjective. So when, when you use whose, you must always have a noun to immediately follow whose, right? Uh, if you stick with the conventional rule, right, in grammar, whose must always be used to modify a human head, right? Uh, we don't use it uh, with non-human head, right? So, you know, when you use whose, right? Whose, we use whose uh, to refer to something that is like human, right? For example, a man whose hair, a boy whose uh, homework, whatever, right? But, you know, look at uh, this example cited here. This is from the, uh, you know, uh, real English right, from corpus, right, uh, based on corpus of contemporary American English or Coca, Prague, you know Prague? Yeah, the capital of 
Czech Republic, right? It's a very beautiful town. Yeah, uh, historically important town in Eastern Europe, Prague or Praha, not in Czech, right? Prague was always an international city whose culture was dependent on native and external tradition, right? So, you know, if you adhere to classic rules, right, you might think that this sentence is ungrammatical or inappropriate, right, syntactically speaking. But actually, native speakers don't care about the rules, right? Many grammar rules in English are not uh, followed by even native speakers of English, right? The rules are the rules. But you know, when they use language, especially in their real life, in their speaking, or in their informal writing, they don't care about the rules. They sometimes even violate the rules, right? So, you know, maybe you have to be more flexible. Uh, I think today you are going to broaden your horizons and worldviews about uh, how to use English, how to teach English and what to teach. How can we reconsider what to include in our lesson plans, right? When it comes to uh, English grammar, vocabulary and so on and so forth, right? Okay. In reality, right, if you have such a question, right, if you have such questions that I uh, exemplify earlier, right, some of you might say, Ajanta, we can ask native speakers, right? Uh, I think that at your university, you have some native speakers uh, joining you as a colleague, right? Maybe some are Australian, some are Canadian, some are American, some are British, right? But my question is, in reality, can we always have access to native speakers of English? The answer is not always, right? Yeah, no, right? Because, you know, sometimes I think, think about this. You are writing your essay, right? Or you are grading your students, uh, undergraduate student essays. So, you know, some, some of us, uh, we enjoy working at night. Actually, we, we don't enjoy, but actually, right, uh, during the during the day, we have to do some other things, teaching, preparing for our lesson, and you know, we spare our late night for grading, right, for scoring. And sometimes you get stuck with some questions that your students are not asking you, but you, you yourself have some question. For example, the student use some uh, word combination in, your, in their writing, and you are not so sure whether the combination uh, sounds correct or not in English, right? And you want to check. Uh, the truth is, the fact is, you can't always access native speakers of English. And what is more, more importantly, the second question is more interesting. Can we always trust native speakers' intuition of their L1? Right, L1 means first language, right? So even though they speak English as their native language, their level of education is different from one to another, right? Uh, so some of them might be using English, but they are more familiar with spoken English. Think about native speakers, right? Think about when we speak Thai, or when you speak L1 Burmese, when you speak L1 Mandarin, right? We are not perfect user of that language, right? Yeah, there are many grammar rules that we don't know. We, we, we know how to use it correctly but we don't know uh, the rules. Maybe you cannot explain the rules. Or, you know, most of the time, we misspell many words in Thai, right? Even it's in our mother tongue. Yeah, we misspell it in our own mother tongue. So the same thing applies to English native speakers, right? That's why, you know, when I have some questions, I have to choose, even at Tamasat, right? Not all native speakers of English have the same uh, ability, have the same competence to uh, explain something uh, to us, right? So you, you, you have to know who you can consult, who you should not consult, right? Even though they speak the same L1, right? Yeah, yeah. some, some, some of them might say, okay, you can use this, but maybe uh, in standard English, that's not acceptable, but maybe some who are more knowledgeable or they have been reading a lot of academic uh, essays or research articles might be a better choice, right? So my talk, uh, okay, I'm going to walk you through 
these areas, right? Using language corpora in learning authentic English, using language corpora in ELT research, and the last thing, using language corpora in e English pedagogy, right? In teaching, right? You know the term pedagogy, right? Okay. Uh, before we start, right? Uh, let me introduce you to some terms, right? Corpus. Corpus is a uh, a singular term, right? And you know, when you change it to the, a plural form, we use corpora, not corpuses, right? So this is an irregular noun, right? Actually, in English, there are many nouns whose plural forms are not just, you know, uh, constructed with using S or adding S or ES, right? You think about uh, fungus, you know, fungus, right? And the plural is fungi, right? child, children, woman, women, right? And so on and so forth, right? Corpus is one exception, right? So, you know, when you use the plural form, we use the term corpora, okay? Uh, generally speaking, corpus is a collection of written and spoken texts. Uh, in, uh, actually, the term corpus is not a new term. It has been used in linguistics. So, you know, when you compile a text, in any, any, any language or a text for any purpose, right? For example, if you are a real fan of Shakespeare, right, you know William Shakespeare, and you might compile that work, all poems, all, uh, anything, right? Poems, uh, plays like Romeo and Juliet, Richard III, Taming of the Shrew, anything, you compile them, yeah, as your collection. This is called a corpus. But in the old days, like 50 years ago, 60 years ago, everything was done manually, right? So, you know, it was very hardworking, demanding, and, you know, it's prone to errors because, you know, when human uh, beings, right, collected everything by hands, right? Yeah, you know, chances are some errors could occur, right? But, you know, right now, when we talk about corpus linguistic, the first thing that pops up in our mind is computer. Digital literacy, computer literacy. So, you know, computers will allow corpus linguists for uh, less manual uh, work, right? And more systematic uh, process. Okay, according to O'Keefe, McCarthy, and Carter, right? So they are well-known corpus linguists, right? Uh, corpus is defined as a principal collection of electronic texts stored store mean kept on a computer, right? Available for qualitative and quantitative analysis, right? So, you know, this is one of the easiest definitions of corpus, right? Actually, uh, if you study corpus linguistic, it can be defined in a more comprehensive way. But uh, this one is quite straightforward. This one is quite straightforward, right? Okay. And actually, right, uh, I, I think I, I have shared the slide with you. Uh, you got the slide, right? Yes, yes, okay, thank you, right. Yeah, that's okay. So you don't have to jot down everything, right? Uh, there are different types of corpora, right? It depends on our, our purpose of the study, right? Of your research or of your teaching. Uh, some are native speaker corpora. So native speaker corpora, they are collections of only the language used by native speaker of the language. Like for example, if you are studying English, you might want to look at the samples of uh, American speakers, British speakers are mixed, right? Learner corpora. Learner corpora uh, consists of the language, the, the language samples of students, right? For example, you might uh, ask them to write essays or compositions in English, but, but rather than writing, you know, right now during the COVID-19 pandemic, right, you prefer something that is digital, right? You prefer soft file. So you ask the student to send to submit soft files, right, that they typed. Right, so it's easier for you to conduct research, right, with uh, learner corpora. Learner corpora are cor corpora consisting of learner language, right? Okay, you might want to study how they use language. You might want to study the student errors, something like that. Oh, you know, it, uh, it could be divided into written 
and spoken corpora, right? Can you guess between written and spoken corpora? If you are a researcher, if you are a corpus linguist research, linguistic researcher, which type of corpora between written and spoken is more difficult to obtain? I think the spoken one, sir. Okay, why spoken? Ajahn Vanchana, why spoken? It's something we, we just um, use the language in the form of to communicate. It's not a, the uh, kind of, not certain evidence that we can, we can investigate. Oh, we, yeah, you, your answer is right, right? But your justification is not, is not quite uh, spoken, right? We are talking about uh, how to compile corpus, right? Uh, spoken is more difficult. It's, it's more difficult to compile spoken corpora because, you know, written corpora, you can just, you, you can just collect it from anything. For example, if you want to study the language in websites or web blogs, you can just vis visit plenty of web blogs and copy and paste as long as it's not copyrighted, right? Yeah, for example, you study the language used in advertisement, cosmetic advertisement. So you go to different websites and you just copy and paste them for your own uh, educational purposes for your study that's usually allowed, right? But think about spoken. If you want to compile spoken uh, corpus, think about speeches. Think about TED Talks, you know, TED Talks, right? Speeches, um, maybe uh, US president speeches, right? If you don't have scripts, things would be much more difficult. It would be very challenging, okay? Because it's going to involve what? If you have, if you have only the, the spoken data, how can you transform it into the written one? You know what I mean? If you have only the audio file, right? You need transcription, right? You need a uh, phonetic transcription. You need to transcribe, right? You know, some of my students, uh, Paul Ritu, she is a PhD student and she did her study on move analysis, right? On this course analysis. And she looked at the uh, business pitches, right? Yeah, you know, pitch, right? It's like SME feedback, right? And, you know, she looked at the pitches in English, but, you know, she, wasn't able to access all the scripts. So, so you know, she, she's Indian, right? Uh, her English was very good, right? So she said, okay, Ajahn, I will trans I would transcribe all of them. I said, no, Ritu, don't do that, right? It would be, you know, uh, lab laborious, right? It's, it would be very labor intensive, right? But she said, okay, I can, I'm, you know, free time, I'm like full time student, right? But actually, uh, she did that and you know she said Ajahn, it's like you know we i went to the hell right because you know it took me time to transcribe everything right you know when you deal with spoken uh, language or when you are trying to compile spoken corpora right it's going to be you know far more difficult than doing with dealing with a written one parallel corpora is like you have corpora of the same content right uh, we often use this uh, in translation. If you are interested in translation, you, you, you can have that, right? Yeah, for example, think about Harry Potter, right? Harry Potter is a very well-known uh, book, right? Novel, right? It's been translated into different languages. Maybe you want to compare between Harry Potter, uh, the Thai version, Burmese version, Chinese version, Korean version, Japanese version. So you need to uh, construct your parallel corpora, right? Okay, maybe it's not uh, quite related to our ELT. ESP corpora, this is very interesting, right? Uh, what, what does it mean ESP? This is a term in our field, right? What, what does ESP stand for? English for specific purposes. Very good, Ajahn Rosamund, right? English for specific purposes. What, what are some examples of ESP courses, right? Um, English for advertisement. English for advertisement. Thank you, Kapa Jan What else? English for accounting. English for accounting, English for engineering, English for lawyers, right? So, you know, when we talk about ESP, we think about the courses that are specially designed 
for some particular area careers or jobs, right? They are like English for professions, right? Okay. So maybe some of you are teaching ASP. It depends, right? Uh, if you are teaching English major students, right? Uh, you are focusing more on teaching skills or even literature, right? But if you are teaching at language institute like I do, right? You are going to be in charge of teaching, yeah, different kinds of English for, right? English for different jobs, right? Yeah, English for science, English for health science, English for blah, 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 right? So maybe you might want to create your own corpus, right? Uh, my PhD student, Dr. Tosapon from Burapa University, you know, he's a very good student, a good researcher, right? Uh, he has been teaching English for science for a number of years, right? And he talked to me, Ajahn, I would like to help my students, uh, you know, most of whom are from the Faculty of Science. I like them to, to, to uh, read uh, faster and better when they, when they deal with uh, their texts, right? Because, you know, the student at Burapa University, although they are undergrad student, they have to read a lot of uh, scientific books, articles, right? So uh, to support at that time, right, he worked with me, right? Uh, he studied corpus linguistic with me and he started doing a project in word list compilation, right? He collected the data from uh, scientific books that are very common uh, in the field, especially for those at uh, student at Burapa University, and he also collected the data of research articles uh, in the field. And you know the the articles were published in journals recommended by the lecturers there, right? That you know they are very well known journals, right? And you know he compiled a word list, right? He compiled a word list. So maybe one day you may want to compile your own word list, right? Uh, compiling a word list is fun, but it's not, not very easy, right? Not very easy. It's not like you, you, you just uh, put, put the data into the program and just then uh, ask them to run uh, the words according to frequency. That's part of it. But actually, uh, there are many steps involved. You need to look for the words, delete the words that are frequent, but not specific to the field, like articles, preposition, proper names, right? And you need to ask experts in the fields to help you judge and select words, right? Something like that. So maybe I uh, can, can ask you, how many of you are teaching ESP? How many of you here? I, I think some of you are teachers, right? Most of you are teachers. Are you teaching or have you ever taught ESP courses? If you want to talk to me, please turn on your microphone. Yes, I teach um, English for public relations. Right. Oh, very good. So, Ajahn, uh, you are teaching English for public relations. Where? Uh, Rajapat Ubon. Okay, Rajapat Ubon. Rajapat Ubon. Okay, so nice to know you, Ajahn Patanan. So, uh, that's uh, an, a very good example of ESP course. Are there any other, other students? Yes, sir. Yes, Ajahn. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, I taught uh, English for accountant. Oh, right. Yeah, English but, for but, accountant. but it's not a, a major student. It's not English, right, sure. but it's other. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> right. So, you know, when we teach this, right, our target students are not in, um, English major students, right? They are students from other faculties, right? And, you know, they just, they just do maybe some foundation English and then English uh, for specific purposes, maybe just one or two courses, right? And then they leave you, right? Not like English major students, right? Okay. Are there any other students, right, that are teaching English for specific purposes? Yes, sir. For me, it's yes. for uh, educational, no, physical education teachers. Oh, right. Oh, that's interesting. Plus, it's our, right, physical that's education. Right. So, so that's very interesting, right? You can do research on this because, you know, to the best of my knowledge, there are not many previous studies on, you know, physical education, right? Uh, some lecturers at Kasesa University, I talked to her the other day, she wanted to join uh, me in our research work. And she said, Ajahn, 
uh, she just called me P. P. Uh, you know, I have done some word list uh, in sport science, right? So I said, oh, wow, sport science, you know, sport science and physical education are very related, right? Something like that, because, you know, I want to help my students learn which words uh, are very important for them to learn so that they are not going to get lost, right? Ajahn Vachana, where are you teaching? Uwon Rajana University, University. Oh, the same, right? The same as Ajahn Patanan. Are you from right. the same faculty? Yes, yeah, the same one. The uh, different Kana, program. Right. Kana. Uh, human. Which faculty? Humanity. Oh, humanity, human. right? Kana. Manusa, uh, right? Manusa Yasa. Oh, that's a Komasa. Oh, Manusa Yasa, that's a Komasa. Who's off, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like Buri that's a part, right? So uh, this is my own observation. Many uh, universities uh, in the eastern, northeastern of Thailand, right? They have Fu Sok, right? Manusia Sat and Sokomasa, like Buri Ram, that's a part, or more Mahasarakam, right? Or more, even more Hongan, right? They have Fu Sok, right? So that's a trend, right? Okay, so if but, but you know some of you might be interested in doing research uh, in literature, maybe you might want to compile uh, your own uh, what uh, data right from the novels right. Uh, if you if you want to look at the way the some some characters Natolakorn the main characters in novels like uh, Jane Austen's main characters, speeches, or whatever, you might want to collect your own data, right? But you know, that's going to be something that is more literature based, right? Okay, terminology that you should know. Uh, I'm going to show you how to use uh, corpus, uh, basically, right? So, so that all of you can uh, make use of this for your own teaching, and at least for your own language search, right? Concordance me using corpus software, to find every occurrence of a particular word or phrase, right? I'm, I'm showing uh, this to you soon. And you can use concordance program, right? There are many uh, software programs that you can use for free or some you need to buy, and they are going to help you uh, analyze the data in your corpus very easily. The node means the word that you use in your search, right? It's like when you search using Google, the word that you you put in the search box is called the node, the node word or the node phrase, right? And keyword in context being the node word that is presented in the uh, corpus, right? I'm showing it to you soon, right? Uh, there are many corpora that you can utilize for your own language purposes, right? But I'm, I'm going to introduce you guys to, to right? BNC, uh, British National Corpus. So this one is the largest corpus representing British English, right? Uh, actually, you need to buy, right? I mean, if you want to access the full version of BNC, you need to pay, right? But maybe, maybe you know, before you make a decision to pay for corpus, you have to think carefully, yeah, uh, whether or not it's worth your money, right? Are, are you going to use it? It's like, you know, you pay for membership, for a fitness center, for, you know, gym, 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 right? But you rarely go there. So it's a waste of your time, right? Uh, another one that I like to talk about is uh, Koka. Koka is here, it's not Suki restaurant, you know, in Thai. If you search the word Koka, right? Uh, you are going to be linked to, uh, you know, a Suki restaurant, right? It was once very popular, but now I think it has been outshined by MK. Right, or something of the kind. Koka here re uh, represent corpus of contemporary American English, right? Okay, so here I give you the link, right? So that you can access them. Or if you don't have the link, you can just type it in Google, right? And you know, uh, it's easier that way, right? Uh, I'd like you to try uh, British National Corpus, right? Actually, as I said, you need to purchase, right? But you know, we can use the the Leeds version. The version provided by Uni Leeds University in the UK is free. It's a, a, you know, a short version, but it's, it's good enough for us, for our fundamental uh, research, right? Okay, look at the word consequence, right? What are the common word partners of consequence? Uh, you know, if you are teaching vocabulary, you should know the term collocation. You know the term collocation? What does it mean collocation? Have you ever heard the term collocation? Location uh, means place, right? 
and COL call means together. Collocation means words in language that tend to appear together, right? That, that's collocation. So, you know, when you teach vocabulary, not only should you teach the student the word and its meaning, but it's going to be much more useful if you teach them common collocations that the words can often be combined with, right? Yeah, and there are many words in English that take, even though they are syn synonyms, right? They are very similar in meaning. They take different uh, words to be used with. For example, right? Uh, very classic example are the words uh, strong and powerful, right? Strong and powerful. We, they are synonymous in a way, right? So when you talk about engine, engine of a car, right? We can say the car has a strong engine or the car has a powerful engine. So in that particular context, strong and powerful are interchangeable, right? They, they can be used interchangeably. But think about some other contexts where only strong but not powerful is allowed. Can you, can you think of any context where you can use only strong but not powerful? They are not synonymous in other words. If you are talking about force, okay, they are close in meaning and they can be sometimes used uh, interchangeably. Right. But think about strong tea, right? Some of you enjoy drinking strong tea, right? Yeah, maybe right, you are old enough and you enjoy drinking strong, strong tea, you need more caffeine, right? You, you don't say powerful tea, right? It's going to sound very uncommon or even strange, right, to say. Powerful tea. Can, can you make me a cup of powerful tea? Your student might feel confused, right? What is this teacher is asking me to do, right? Something like that. Okay, now let's talk, let's think about the word consequence, right? I think about consequence. Okay, what are the common word partners of consequence? So you can learn from, from this. Okay. Okay, uh, you can just call a uh, purpose lead, protected, okay, right, and you click the first search uh, result. So you are going to be introduced to something like this, a collection of English corpora, right, and you know there are many sub corpora here, right, but usually the default is being for British National Corpus, right? This is not the full version because as I said, for the full version, you need to pay, right? But actually for beginner, for beginning user like us, we can use uh, this version, okay? You can type the word consequence, okay? And you can sort, right, in the concordance, right? You can sort left, you can sort right, you can set the output to 100, 200, or 300 lines. Let's say 300. Okay, if you want to find adjectives, okay, what is the position of adjectives in English before or after now? After now, sir. Uh, after now, if the adjective will come after now, if and only if you have a linking verb or a uh, you know, verb to be, right? For example, we say, Jane is smart, right? Jane is smart, right? Yeah, but, but usually when we say smart, smart is an adjective. Smart boy, right? We say a smart boy, smart kid, smart children, right? Something like that. So usually adjective is placed before a noun, right? Before a noun, right? So here we uh, should sort left, right? We should sort left because when you sort left, uh, you know, uh, okay, and click submit and wait, right? So you can see that, you know, the first word before the word consequence. See, this is called keyword in context or quick. This is called keyword in context nah? or quick, sorry, right? Uh, yeah. Right, so you can see that the word that you are searching for is presented in the middle. And then, you know, some seven to eight words are given on the left and on the right hand side, right? So, you know, uh, corpus linguists claim that with the context like this, 
you can study and you can draw some observation on the language, right? On English that you are using, right? But you know, uh, right now it's much more amazing. If you want to know more context, for example, you are interested in this one, right? You can click and you are going to be, you are going to have access to the whole, the whole thing, the whole, uh, context, right, larger context, right? So this is even better for you to understand the context, right? Okay, now you can see that they are arranged according to alphabetical order, a consequence, a consequence, another consequence. So at least we know that the, the term consequence is countable. Why? Because it can be preceded by a, right? A, a, a consequence, another consequence, say me, huh? Now, by consequence, so you can learn by consequence, or at least, right, you can, you can expand your own knowledge of the now consequence. Oh, we can say in consequence, in consequence, in consequence mean when you compare something, right? When you compare two things, right? In consequence, see? And this is quite very frequent, right? Maybe you can say, oh, wow, I have never learned this in my writing course. Think about, you know, when you are teaching, uh, comparison and contrast essay, right? You have been learning a lot, right? From the book, right? Like the terms for comparison and with contrast, but you know, from my experience, right? I rarely see the term uh, in consequence, but in corpus, right? In the corpus, in authentic language, in consequence is very common, see? So you can reconsider uh, this, right? By maybe including this in your lessons, right? Ah. Now, focusing on the adjective, okay? Look at the adjective of consequence. Okay, main consequence, logical consequence, necessary consequence, political, physical, profile consequence, ridiculous consequence, right? Okay, unfortunate consequence, unexpected consequence, undesirable consequence, unintended. Okay, not only should we take adjectives into consideration, I would like you to take a look at the whole context, right? Okay, you, you read, read more, right? Read the words that come before consequence and the words that follow consequence and tell me what you have learned. What is the sense of the word consequence that you have learned from these slides? You, you can start with this one, yeah. Look at the words that uh, surround consequence. Maybe you can see expenditure, you know expenditure, right? This is a formal term for expense, right? Uh, you can see the outcome was not the consequence of direct intention to exploit the colony. So you see, exploit, exploit means take advantage of colonies. So you see the word uh, miserable business. Uh, so that, that's negative. Regret. So that's also negative. You say the word jet lag, right? Jet lag is like, you know, if you fly to the United States, right? You are going to suffer a lot from the time difference. So that's called jet lag. Right, uh, you see the word mismatch, right? Uh, you can see the word murder cases. You can see get rid of consequent of murder case. You can see the word, uh, many other words, right? Uh, rejection, right, okay, blackout, okay? Unfortunate, okay, what have you learned about the, the now consequence? Uh, for this word, we can use uh, various contexts. Uh, can, can, can you be more specific? Uh, to give, to give some example from various type of uh, using the, the word consequence. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so, you know, when you consider the words surrounding consequence, we have learned that the term consequence is more common in negative context, right? It's more common in negative context. That's why, you know, this may consequence different 
from its synonyms, right? Different from result or outcome. Results are more general, right? They, they are not specific to positive or negative context, right? But consequent is more uh, common in negative context, right? So, you know, this is something that uh, dictionaries or even native speakers do not tell us. Maybe, maybe you, you, you know, if, if you ask your American friends, what's the difference between result and consequent? It takes them time to think about these examples in their head, right? And they, they can make, they can draw some generalization for you, right? Okay, why don't we try result? Long do have result. See, you can see that the word result is quite neutral. You, you can use it in a negative sense, like result shock most people, but you know, you can see uh, result in a positive sense as well, result attracted attention, something like that. And you can see it, it, uh, the word result is more common in research. So, you know, when you, when you do your PhD thesis and when you write results, right? Result and discussion, that's the word result. You don't use the word outcome nor do we use the word consequence, right? So the word result is more related to research, right? Okay. Ah, let's come back to our second question. I'm writing, sorry, I'm writing an essay. With what adjectives other than great can be used to modify the noun achievement? Okay, what else? Ah, can, 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 can you contribute? Can you help me? Right, if you are going to write achievement, right, you, you have the noun achievement, which means success, right? It's a good word. And you want an adjective to modify this noun. And you know that you can use great achievement. Actually, you know, great is like uh, umbrella adjective, right? You can use it with any noun, right? And you will never commit any errors, right? But actually, if you want to use more variety, you know, in writing, you need to access a lot of variety, right? So that your language would be more, uh, you know, beautiful or whatever, right? Can, can you give me some, some possible adjective in front of achievement? Amazing achievement. I like that. Amazing achievement. Amazing, maybe. What else? Um, Considerable. Alena, ah, that's a very good word. Considerable. Achievement. Considerable. Ah, maybe. Considerable means a lot of, right? Okay. What else? So major. it's great to hear from you. Yes, major. Ajahn. Major. Major, maybe major. Very good. What else? Ah, uh, this, this is you know your guess, right? I, I'm not confirming whether it's correct or not, right? Uh, Right, but, but we are going to check, right? You say major, some of you say uh, what considerable, uh, amazing, right? Okay, let's check with this. Just type the word achievement. Actually, you can try using your own uh, laptop or uh, make sure that you don't misspell because you know it's not as clever as uh, Google, right? In Google, right? If you are using Google, if you misspell any word, it's going to provide you with uh, you know a more appropriate spelling. But you know, in in this, it won't right submit. Ah, uh, okay. So, what are adjective that you got? Oh, so, Kumun Ong, right? Ong, you got it right. Considerable. Considerable achievement. So you got it right. Uh -huh. to, to hence, you, you see the same uh, screen that I'm sharing, right? Compelling. Compelling means interesting, right? See, maybe you haven't known this, or maybe you have known this adjective, but maybe when you write, you it's very hard for you to think of, you know, between uh, writing and reading. Writing is more difficult than reading because, you know, when you read, you can guess the meaning of the word. Or maybe you know, uh, like this, you know the word compelling. But when you write, you cannot think of it, 
right? You cannot think of it. Or even if you thought of it, you were not so sure whether you can use, you could use it with this now, right? But you know, using corpus that you are searching now, this is going to help you confirm, right? Because you know, these are the list of suggested adjectives that you can, you can adopt. Now, creative, contingent, distinctive, right? Distinctive is another good word, right? Now, distinctive means this is quite uh, different and unique, right? Uh, emphasizing is not everlasting, right? Everlasting, right? extraordinary. Now, this word is pronounced extraordinary. Now, don't say extraordinary, right? extraordinary. So, you know, think about this. If you are writing essays, right? One student used uh, great achievement, but another student used extraordinary achievement. You can guess who is going to get a better score, right? If this, if you are taking IELTS or TOEFL writing uh, part, right? Of course, if you use a more uh, specific word choice, something like that, you know, you are forming a better collocation and uh, it's likely that you are going to gain a better score, right? Oh, think about this, if you're a student, use this combination in their essay and you are not so sure whether you, you uh, whether it's correct or incorrect, you can use corpus to check. You can even type the whole combination, extraordinary achievement, right? Great, of course, great. Great can be used in any context, graders. High achievement, see? Maybe you cannot think of this adjective, high achievement. Yeah, which is very common, right? All of you know high. But maybe you, 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 you cannot think of using high with the noun achievement. So, you know, this can help you. Impressive, my impressive achievement. See, okay, you major, right? So, Ajahn uh, Vantana mentioned the word major. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the frequency is not very high, but you can use it. Main achievement, miraculous. Nah. Modest achievement, but what I have modest achievement, what does it mean modest? Modest. You, you know the word modest, right? Modest, if you talk about a person, a modest person is a person who is humble, right? Humble, right? Modest achievement is mean small amount, right? Not, not much, that's a modest. Nah. Okay, you can, you can explore this uh, by yourself. And you can learn a lot. You can know uh, right now, if you are writing your paper, your term paper for any courses that you study with Ajans at the RU, Ajans Kampira Pap, Ajans Akrapun, right? So, you know, you can beautify your language. You can make your language sound more natural, common, beautiful using, uh, you know, the data from the corpus. And you don't need to consult native speakers at all times, right? You can do this, explore this, right, by yourself, right? So you can access a lot of uh, examples, right, that you can adapt and adopt for your own language use, right? So that's very useful, right? Okay, ah, let's come back here. Ah, okay. Yeah, we are going to take a break at 10.30, right? Maybe, you know, uh, please remind me if I forgot, right? Uh, think about this. Uh, these three words, right? These three, they are linking adverbials in English. You know, the term linking adverbial. You know, in English, there are many terms that are similar in meaning. You can call them linker, linking words, connector, connective, or whatever. Conjunction, conjunct, like that. Nah. But you know, one of the most well-known term is linking adverbial, right? Uh, proposed by Douglas Biber. Okay, thus, hence, and as a result, what do they mean? They have the same meaning. But what I have? When do we use them? to explain um, the results like do okay. hate me right good to show results right actually you know you might say Ajanka, we why don't why don't you include so yeah so is very common but so is more common in spoken english right now so if you search for the word so in corpus yeah i'm quite sure that 
you are going to see a lot of samples of so. But in academic writing, right, in academic English, so is not very common, right? Thus, hence, as a result, and therefore, okay. Thus, hence, as a result, therefore, which one do you think is the most common? The most common mean it has the highest frequency. Thus, as okay, a result. Okay, you say thus. Ah, some say as a result. <laughs> Hence, you know, you uh, know, as even native speakers, right? Uh, you you cannot trust their own common sense because you know I once gave a talk, right? I, you know, the, this is part of my research study done in two thousand seventeen. If if you are interested, right, I can send you the paper. It's published in a Malaysian Scopus Index journal called Three L Language Linguistic and Literature, right? And I presented. The result of the corpus based study on the four linking adverbials, right? Actually, three, right? Uh, I looked at, therefore, thus, hence, right? And also as a result, right? And, you know, I presented this at an international conference. And, you know, at that time, there were native speakers of Canadian English, American English, Australian English, and they all had different opinions. I, I cannot remember exactly, but you know, one say, I will go for as a result, as the most common, but the other say, no, no, you are wrong. I think it's head. And the other say, no, no, it's therefore. And the other one say, no, it's not. So, you know, they speak the same uh, native language, but they have different results because, you know, it depends on how much they are exposed to academic language, right? Some of them are not academic persons, some are, some are not in our field or whatever, right? So, you know, you can use corpus to check, right? Uh, I can show you this, COCA, uh, COCA. COCA is very useful, uh, it's a very useful one, but COCA uh, corpus, I love this one a lot and, you know, it's widely used around the globe, right? Uh, but, you know, the limitation is it will block you after 10 or 15 searches, you'll be blocked. And, you know, they say uh, if you don't want to be blocked from time to time, you have to uh, register, right? You, you, you can, you, you have two options, right? You can uh, write to the COCA manager uh, claiming that you are a PhD student or graduate student at BRU and they are going to give you like more quota to use, right? Or you can even uh, buy. I, 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 I did this. I, I bought this. Not, not, I use premium account. For premium account, the search is unlimited and it's very cheap. I, I don't know. Uh, it's just, I, I, I'm not so sure. 1,000 something for two years, right? That's, that's very good because I use it for my class, for teaching, for exam, whatever. Ah, okay. Ah, nai long na ha. So you can type this word, right? You can type, uh, okay. Uh, therefore, now therefore, and you click five matching screen and you can see this is the frequency, 8,998, uh, sorry. 89,982 times, right? That's quite high. And if you click, you can access the whole context, right? The whole context. You can see the year, right? You can see uh, the genre, the text type. In Koka, there are eight, totally there are eight genres or eight text types, right? Newspaper, magazine, news, fiction, uh, spoken, nah, academic, uh, web blog, uh, web page, something like that, right? There are eight uh, genres, so you can compare the word across genres, right? Okay, so here, they tell you the genre, right? You, you can limit your search to only academic, right? Okay. Yeah, but, but here, you know, I did basic search for you because you are new in our in this field, right? So, yeah, I need to therefore, uh, therefore, frequency is 89982. Nah, okay, record this now. Nah. 
How about hands? Hands. Only to 22,000, right? So the frequency is much lower. Uh, I'm not saying that you should not use hands. No, actually, you can use any word. Hence, therefore, thus, as a result, don't try not to repeat the same word, the same linking adverbial in the same essay, right? Try to use a variety of them. But to know which one is uh, common or the most frequent is useful. Because, you know, when you use that, right? Uh, this is going to start very natural or common. Hence, that. Uh, some of you say as a result. Okay, 47,000, right? It's higher in frequency than hands. Now you have, uh, therefore, therefore, as a result, and hence, uh, thus, along thus. Okay. Nah, 118,000 sanqua. So, you know, uh, from this, we know that thus is the most common, see? Right, so if you, if you ask native speakers of English, like your American friends, your Australian friends, they cannot provide you with a uh, frequency like this. Only the machine can do this, right? But, you know, if you want to teach your students, right, you can refer to the frequency or the scientific facts and no one can reject you because you are talking about facts, right? You are talking about numbers, right? Uh, based on corpus data, okay. Actually, you, you can uh, do a lot more. Nah? Ah. So uh, at this point, we can see that language corpora can provide user with additional information, not existent in dictionary. So, you know, in dictionaries, even though nowadays, most dictionaries, yeah, no matter whether they are a hard copy or the online version, they are corpus based. Longman dictionaries, Oxford dictionaries, Cambridge dictionary, they are mostly corpus based. But, you know, due to the fact that they have limited space, especially the the paperback version, they cannot contain everything or all the sample of English in the dictionary. That's why, you know, you, you can consult dictionary is very good, right? I use dictionary a lot. You can consult dictionaries. You can look at the meanings. You can look at some sentence examples. But the, due to the limited space, the examples given there are restricted in number, right? even though the online version would uh, give you more samples because you know it's online, right? Um, I would suggest that you explore both the dictionary information and the information from Copra, right? Because the information from language Copra like VNC and COCA can benefit you, right? It would allow you to access more data. So as English learner or user, Right. Actually, you know, uh, it's undeniable that we all here are language users. We are teachers, we are users, and at the same time, we are still learners because we are, you know, we continue learning a lot, right? We, we cannot stop learning, right? This is part of our lifelong education. So we can and we should benefit from both sources. This is my own suggestion, right? You should not uh, focus on only dictionary or only corpora, but you know, use both of them as your main resources. Are you with me, right? Okay. Right. And sometimes I need to ask whether or not you can catch up with what I'm sharing. Okay. Ah, before me, we move on to this, right? Let's go back to Coca before we take a break, right? Actually, uh, I'd like to talk more about uh word, right, ah. achievement. Okay, let, let's go back to the word achievement, right? We have seen from the BNC that uh, there are many adjectives like major, main, high, great, considerable, uh, that can be used with achievement, right? Okay, but you know, things would be much more easier if you use COCA, right? Uh, the latest function as of 2020, allow us for a better search, right? You key in the word 
uh, achievement and you choose word กดเลือก word นะฮะเลือก word สิปกติจะเป็น list normally is the default is list you can search la chart and word นะ and then when you click word you are going to see see detailed info for word so click here ใครใครมีแท็บเล็ตลองเล่นดูได้ so here you can learn a lot right look at the graph uh, the, the graph shows the eight different genres of coca มีอะไรบ้างฮะ namely blog web tv tv means the language used in tv series spoke spoken fic fiction mag magazine News, newspaper and acad. Acad is like what does what does acad stand for? Academic. Academic. Very good. Academic. So, so here it shows the frequency. Okay, what what do we know from this frequency? What 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 do we know about the word achievement from this from this graph? We we know like. When um, in what situation this word is usually used? Right. So what is the what is the text type or the genre? You know the word genre, G E N R E, genre. Yeah. Don't say genre, nah. Genre, genre or genre. Right. Genre means text type. So of all the eight genre, academic seems to be the one uh, that is the most common for achievement. So achievement. Is not very common in TV. Think, think about in TV series, right? Uh, no, no characters in TV series. So opera would say achievement, right? But it's much more common in academic language, like in research, like in you know academic books, right? Okay, they provide you with many other details, right? Some example of concordance lie, right? They give you information of collocates. Collocate means collocation, the words that appear together. Yeah. We can use it with improve, measure, relate, predict. You can predict achievement. You can recognize achievement. You can celebrate, demonstrate. Or here, these are you know, listed of common adjectives that we use with achievement, like academic achievement, high achievement, educational, low, significant, But you know what seems to be more amazing is if you want to access more collocation information, click here, collocates, right? And ha, I may have to do video or like that, na kap. See, so you you can see four columns, right? Yeah. Uh, not all columns are useful. For example, when because the collocate col uh, achievement is a noun, right? So when it's a noun, we often use it with adjective or verb, right? So focus on adjective. You can see the uh, they are they are listed according to frequency. So here we can we we know that academic is the the most common adjective to be used with. Ah. Uh, Achievement, right? Academic achievement, and then grade, right? Grade, but you know, grade is not very interesting because even though it's very high in frequency, the word grade can be used with other other nouns, right? The score, t e n s o n g The second column is like the is called M I score, right? It it shows uh, how how attached the search word is with this adjective, right? High, educational, low, individual, significant. Personal, right? And man, nah, remarkable. You can use remarkable, major, outstanding. See, so you know, with this list, you can you you can choose the word from the list, right? And I would suggest that you choose the word that are in the top because you know they are very high in frequency, despite the fact that uh the words that are that are presented later are also possible, right? Even though you use uh, ah, like nah. No, not notable uh, achievement is still okay because the frequency is 86, right? But it, it's going to be more frequent to say impressive, and right? impressive, นะครับ So you know this is very convenient, right? This is very convenient, นะครับ So you can you can sort uh this word, right? นะ For your think about this, if you are going to write a test for your student at your university, like fill in the blank. 
you can choose uh, adjectives that are high in frequency. But of course, you have to be fair, right? Uh, uh, I, I mean, put the words that are frequent or that are possible as a choice, right? And the words that are totally wrong, that are not uh, found in the list, would be like other uh, distractors. Okay, so you can do this by yourself. So this is very convenient, right? You can use this to uh, uh, broaden your worldview, right? Or maybe, okay, think about, talk about some words that are very different apart from perhaps and maybe. Okay, let me talk about the words like, uh, <clears throat> can, can you think of two words that are very close in meaning, but one is formal and the other is informal? There are many. Moreover and furthermore. Oh, actually, furthermore and moreover, and they, are both, they are both the, frequent. They are, ah. they are both uh, associated with uh, academic writing. <laughs> yeah, can, can you find some, some words that are quite uh, simple? Um, yeah, simple. Buy and purchase. Okay, buy and purchase. Purchase. Right. Okay, which one is formal? Which one is informal? Purchase is formal. Okay, ah, look, okay let's search buy. See, the word buy is more common in what uh, text type? Blog, right, blog. Think, think about web blog. Yeah, many web blogs are advertisement. They contain advertisement. And they, maybe they say, okay, when you buy, uh, when you buy this, when you buy uh, vitamin C, when you buy uh, this mineral water, blah, 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 right? So, you know, web blog, blog and web page. You know, they are very similar. And TV series, right? Spoken. Spoken. And, you know, spoken, the fourth one, spoken means, you know, spoken language in general, right? That's uh, fiction, magazine news. But, you know, if you look at the last genre, the word by is the least frequent, right? Because, you know, in academic text, right? How do people talk about the word by? Uh, especially if you, uh, if, if you are not in the field of business. And long purchase. Ah, see? So you can see, even though purchase are, are also common in blog and web, right? They are also much more common in academic, yeah, compared to buy. See? So uh, when you write your research report, you are more likely to use purchase rather than buy if you want to sound formal, right? Okay. Ah, let's try another word before we take a break. Yeah, can, can you give me another word that are uh, one is uh, another pair of word. One is formal, the other is informal. Cust uh, customer and uh, customer and client. Customer and client. Okay, let this check. I'm not so sure. Oh, okay, which one do you think is more formal? I think a uh, customer. Oh, you think customer is more formal? Okay. Yeah. Ah. Look at this. Customer is not very formal because you know if you look at academic, you know with, if you want to make a decision whether it's formal or informal, you you look at academic, right? Yeah, it's like like not very high. Uh -huh. Client. See, client is more formal, right? Client is more formal, right? Because it's higher in frequency in academic text. Right. Usually, you know, client and customer, they are similar in meaning. But I think customer is higher in frequency, in general frequency, because customer can buy anything. But client, usually client are often uh, like frequent customers. Or, you know, if you talk about law firm, you know, client of a lawyer, right? We say client, not uh, uh, customer. See? Okay, maybe. Just, just try another pair. Uh, important. Yilin, yilin. Ah, okay. Important. Or oh, maybe Yili can share her argument. Uh, yilin, yilin. 
I want to hear from you. Hi, Yilin, please turn on your microphone. Are you, can, can you hear me, Yilin? Hi, Yilin. Hello. Hi, hi. So, uh, Yilin, so are you a university lecturer or you are teaching? Yes, you, uh, ah. university lecturer. Right. Uh, where are you from now? Uh, from which province? Uh, Heilongjiang province. Ooh, I know Heilongjiang is very from the north, right? Yeah, northeast. The northeast. Northeast, right? Are you from Harbin? Uh, uh, no. About one more than nearly two uh, two hundred. Uh, oh, right. Heilongjiang. So, so what what is the what is the name of the city or the town that you live in? Suihua. Oh, I have I have never heard about that, but you know, Heilongjiang is like you know, yeah, far very far away from Beijing, right? Now from Beijing, yeah. right? It's up mm. the north, right? Heilongjiang, I think it's next to Russia, right? Close yeah. to Russia, right? Yeah. yeah, I think it's the last uh uh what the province that share the borders with Russia, right? So I think it's quite cold. Uh, what's the weather like now? Mm, now it's uh, summer here. Summer, and, right? Summer, right? Twenty-four. <clears throat> right. 25. Yeah. Uh, twenty-five. Yeah, yeah, that's very good, right? Even summer is twenty-five. Summer in Thailand is like forty something. So Yilin, so you should be well prepared, right? So because you are from very, uh, you know, cold city, right? <laughs> okay, Yilin, you can join us, right? Can you think of a pair of words differing in degree of formality? Yeah. Can anyone help her? <coughs> okay, I can give you one word, right? Uh, entrepreneur. Oh, entrepreneur and what? <laughs> and maybe um company or actually they are not the same this, entrepreneur, yeah, the same. Uh, entrepreneur is like, like a very big uh, entrepreneur this, is like yeah. a person who is doing business yeah right? but yeah, maybe business man uh mm, <laughs> I, I think the meaning are not quite close right uh -huh. businessman is uh businessman is uh right it's broader do, in the sense yeah. right it's broader in the sense okay. right Think, think about easy words, right? Your life would be more, <laughs> much more, much more simple, right? Um, okay. How about large and immense? Okay, large and immense. Are uh, large. Okay, large. Right. See, uh, maybe huh? the word large, right? Large is easy, but it's very, you know, actually the word large is very easy, easy word, but you know we can use it in, yeah, academic, academic. word, academic text. Right, magazine as well, right, news and also web. But you know, large is not, is not very uh, frequent in TV series, right? In, you know, the conversation between husband and wife, friends, right? But in spoken language in general, it's okay. How about immense? Yeah, you say immense, Shemeha, high soul word. <laughs> Again, oh. right, yeah. I think the, the distribution is not much different. Right, it's not much different, but of course, it meant because you know if you compare, you can see that it meant is more is more literally word, right? It's 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 in fiction, right? So if you read uh poems or novels or yeah short stories, right, it's more likely that you are going to come across the word immense, right? Yeah, so I think it's it's more associated with literally word, okay. How about give and provide? Give. Give. See? Give. It's not, it's not very uh, academic because, you know, it's just in the middle, right? But it's much more common. It's, it's the most common in TV, right? Think, think about in TV series where, you know, the characters talk to each other. I give you this, I give you that. Why don't you give me love? Something like that. And you know, the word give is very common in blog and web as well. 
How about provide? Again, see, so you can see a, a clear contrast, right? Provide is not very common at all in TV series or in fiction or in spoken, but in academic, you know, provide is the most frequent, right? So that, that's why, you know, uh, you have to be uh, very careful yeah, when it comes to word choice, when you write your research report, right? Yeah. One thing right, right, that is going to help you for publication. You know, I'm editor in chief of a, a learned journal index in Scopus. And you know, sometimes, right, uh, some authors submit a paper that was written using very informal language. And you know, those paper could be easily rejected, right? Because the language is not appropriate. So please be careful. Don't use the word like let. Nah, nah, nah. Uh, you know, the other days I saw the word let in one paper, right? Yeah. And, and you know, they use contraction like isn't, doesn't. So, you know, these words, right? Contractions like uh, doesn't, don't, won't, or let, they should not appear in academic paper. Ah, you can try let and allow. Nah, let. Which one is formal? Which one is more formal? Let or allow? Allow. Allow is yeah, more formal. Very allow. good. Allow for sure. Yeah, let see. Let is the most common. It's quite clear, right? The most common in TV. Tema. Nah, in, yeah. And also common in spoken, in fiction, respectively. Because, you know, in conversation, when people converse with each other, they use let. Let me do that. Let her do that. Let blah, blah, blah. Right. How about allow? Don't say alone. Nah. Some students on my say hello. No, right? It's allow. Hmm. Oh, it's quite high, right? Actually, it's quite high in academic, in news, in blog, in web, right? Because you know, web and blog, web, web, web blog, web page and web blog, they are written, right? Not, uh, but allow is the least frequent in TV, right? In TV series. So this show are quite a stark contrast between formality degree that synonyms are associated with, right? Even though they are very close in meaning, they can be distinguished uh, based on the, the formality degree that the word belong to, right? Okay, I'm um, stop sharing. Uh, before we take a break, uh, are there any questions that you would like to ask Kao Kajan? So I know Ajahn Banchana, Ajahn Patanan, you are from Rajapat Pubon, Chemehai, Yi Li, you are from Heilong Jiang, Ajahn Rosamon. Buriam Rajapat University. Oh, you are you, you are a faculty member here? Yes. No. Uh, from, from this uh, faculty, this, right? Yeah. Oh, right. Business uh, English program. Oh, business English so. program, right. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> sorry, na, I, it's okay. you don't look familiar to me. Na, you don't look familiar. Oh, last back, right? We had Ajahn Supakit, Chema, Ajahn Supakit. He was eh, Chai Maha. Oh, no, that's okay. Ajan Sida, Ajan Jan Sida. Uh, Chai, like Ajan Pushai, Ponche Jan Lena, Ajan Ajan Sidisa. Ajan Sidisa, right? Assistant Professor Sidisa, right? Yeah. Who joined us as the first back, right? Ajan Piyashat, where are you from? Ajan Piyashat, who told you? Oh, my heart. Jan Rashapana Kona Sima. Ah, Rashapana Kona Sima. Okay, Kap, a Kura, Nakap. Ah, okay, Kap. อาจารย์ท่านอื่นล่ะครับอาจารย์ปฏิยาอ๋ออาจารย์ออนซีดีจากไหนครับเซมค่ะ I'm from uh Rajapat Korat ค่ะรัชพัฒน์ Korat yeah the same so you are colleagues of อาจารย์ปิยชัด right yes yes ค่ะอ่า uh, okay good อาจารย์ปฏิยาจากไหนฮะ where are you from อ่าสาขาวิชาภาษาอังกฤษธุรกิจค่ะอ๋อรัชวีรามค่ะใช่โอเค oh, okay. so so you are uh, colleagues of Ajahn Rosamond นะอาจารย์ปฏิยา good to know you and how about Sumon Ong sorry if I miss uh, pronounce your name. Uh, can can you can you pronounce your name for for me, please? Sumon. Uh, Sumon Ong, right? Ong Ong means go, right? So where are you from? From which part of Myanmar? Uh, Mandalay. Oh, you're Mandalay. from Mandalay, right? You're from Mandalay, right? No, actually, you know, we went to Mandalay, uh, right? Ajahn Akrapon, the dean, right? Organized one international conference in Mandalay in 2019, right? It was a very successful conference. I love it, right? Yeah, we all enjoyed, right? Uh, that's very good international conference, right? Ajahn Akrapon Kylie invited me to be a speaker there. 
right? So, so you know, I went to Mandalay twice in my life. I, I love uh, Mandalay a lot, right? So, you know, if you have time, you can visit uh, Sumon Ong uh, in Mandalay. She's going to show you around, right? Yeah, especially if you are Buddhist, right? You, you enjoy uh, a lot of temples, beautiful temples there, right? Do you live in the town, right? I, I mean, in the city center or? Yes, I'm in the city center. Ah, right. Which university? Uh, uh, Yadanabo University. Oh, right, right. Right, maybe you should know Professor Nini, right, Nini, Professor yes. Nini. Yes. Ah, right, yeah. Maybe you're from the same uh, university, the same uh, department, right? Yes, she is my right. teacher, yes. Oh, really? Oh, right, right. Considering her age, she should be your teacher, right? <laughs> okay, very good, right, very good. So we have uh, students from a lot of nationalities, right, Chinese, uh, Vietnamese, and Thai, Nakab. Right, and Ajahn Yutachak, I know him. Yimon is from the first batch, right? Uh, Ajahn Daw is also from the first batch. Okay, so uh, why don't we take a break for 15 minutes? 15 minutes, sir. 15 minutes, yeah. we are gonna meet up again at 11, right? And it's 11. Uh, don't worry, I'll give you time, maybe 15 minutes before we have lunch, right? So that you can ask. Or actually, you know, after, after we come back from the break, uh, you can ask me any questions that you have so that we can move on. So thank you very much. See you soon. Okay, all right, in the first part of this webinar. <laughs> okay, now the... <laughs> okay, he leave already. Oh, okay, I just want, want to mention that Professor Subhagan uh, give us the definition of scroll parts. Uh, so sorry, call pass. So call pass is a correction of written and so spoken and also types of uh, core parts that we have to know and especially uh, the convenient way to, uh, to to look for the words that we're going to use in the academic uh, form like uh, research or uh, any article that we use BNC or core card. Okay, all right. right. Now we have 10, 15 minute break. Okay, see you in the second part. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second part of this morning section. We are uh, with the guest speaker from uh, Thammasat University, Professor Suhagorn. Okay, right, right now, may I invite Associate Doctor, uh, also Associate Professor Doctor Suhagorn to resume the lecture, please. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor Machana. Right, so let's continue. Um, I'm sharing the screen again. Right. Okay, so here, the next topic is about grammar, right? We looked at vocabulary, right? Another area of ELT uh, that uh, we can uh, often use corpus linguistics, right? With is uh, grammar, right? So corpora for English teachers. So we are going to take these three topics into our consideration. Namely, negative contractions like isn't, uh, is not, conditionals, and get passive. Okay, let's start with the first one. Uh, you know, when you were young, right, you might have been taught that uh, you can use either is not and isn't, right? So, you know, in, in Thailand, right, most textbooks, they often say, right, the most common uh, negative contraction of is not is isn't, right? So we were, we will, we will, uh, formally taught to use he isn't, right, as a negative contraction of he is not, he is not, right. They aren't, right, we aren't, but for am, we, we don't, we have, we, we, we have no contraction for am not, right, we can not say am not, right. But, right, in reality, right, uh, you can see that uh, which one occurs more frequently. We are not talking about correctness, but we are talking about Commonness, right? Commonness means, yeah, which one is more common, which one is more frequent in authentic English, right? So he's not a gentleman and he isn't a gentleman. Both are correct, both are grammatically perfect, right? Okay, what do you think? In the past, what we focus on, what our teachers focus on when we, we were taught was just teach anything that is correct. Right, but right now we should go up to another uh, more advanced uh, level, right? By in incorporating, uh, by introducing something that is more common, so that our students will uh, tend to use language that is uh, common, natural, right? So even though both are correct, I would like you to see uh, this information. Sorry, this one. Okay, this is in the handout. Uh, right, the corpus data from North American English segment shows that uh, he is not, right, he's not. The frequency is uh, 704. Uh, the corpus is quite small at that time, right, like more than two years ago. But when, it compare, when it's compared to he isn't, Right, we can see that he's not as far more frequent or more common than he isn't, right? Uh, in a similar vein, she's not, yeah, occurs 476 times, which is much more common than she isn't, which occurs only 15 times, right? So we can draw a conclusion here that when the subject is a pronoun, like he, like she, like they, like we, like it, right? It's much more common to use apostrophe s and then not, rather than to put the uh, the verb the, the the auxiliary verb like is with the contraction form, right? Even though both are correct, right? Uh, the use of uh, not uh, that is quite uh, appear up independently, right? Of the auxiliary is more common, right? And you know, look at this, how can we apply this to teaching? This is a very uh, well-known uh, textbook series called Touchstone. It was published in 2005. And at that time, right, the corpus-based materials and textbook became very well-known, right? So, you know, people were amazed, right? Teachers were amazed when they were presented with this kind of textbook, right? Look at this. Yeah, when you teach yes, no question, right? Uh, this is for maybe high school students, right? 
am I late? Yes, you are. No, you are not. You're not late, right? So you can see the textbook writers are called distinguished. Professor Michael McCarthy, uh, McCartan and Sandiford, they all are corpus linguists. So they choose the example that are quite common and representative because you know, when you teach young students, like maybe lower level of uh, high school student, right? You should not bombard them with too many examples. Just choose examples that are representative, meaning that uh, it's more common for them is more likely that they are going to see this in their everyday life. That's why, you know, after showing the examples of just no question and negatives, right? The writer uh, add this, like, you know, a, a note box, like in conversation, people use apostrophe as not and are not. After pronouns, like she's not strict, they are not nice, right? And isn't and aren't follow nouns. Now on our phrase like, my boss isn't strict. My co-workers are nice. So actually, you know, this observation are based on their research, right? This is based on their research findings, right? But they want to make uh, the presentation of findings more practical and, you know, more, uh, you know, easier, right? Much easier for the understanding of the teachers and students in general, right? That's why they choose not to use technical terms, right? They, they try to use something that is quite straightforward, like pronoun now, and, you know, they avoid talking about corpus, right? Because they don't want to make the student uh, feel uh, repelled or, you know, uh, taken aback, right? See? So, but this is how to include corpus data in lessons, right, in English lessons. First, not only should you teach something correct, but teachers uh, are supposed to be introducing something that is more common in the examples. And, you know, try to uh, make some observation for the student, right? Now, so that, you know, when the students see uh, their observation, they are going to, yeah, put this into good use in their future, right? Uh -huh. ah. Now let's come back here. Oh, uh -huh. So this is the uh, conclusion, right? This is the conclusion. Now look at uh, each classes, right? Uh, as we earlier discussed, there are three main types of conditional, right? Uh -huh. There are three main types of conditionals. Uh, in English, uh, type if class type one, type two, and type three, right? Uh, many many Thai uh, learners, right? When it comes to the three types of if clause, right? They often, uh, sorry, they often uh, have that label, right? Yeah, they call type one present uh, conditional, right? Future possible, type two present and real or whatever. But actually, right? Uh, from what I have seen in you know, grammar references written by native speakers. They just call them in a very easy manner, type one, type two, type three, right? But you need to know which type, uh, how, how, how to use them correctly, right? Uh, I did one study that I'm going to share with you soon, right? But you know, in authentic American English, right? The three classic types accounts for only half of the conditionals. So there must be something wrong. You know what I mean, right? I mean, in the, in the real, uh, what? Uh, I mean, huh? in, in, in the real English, right? So, you know, in the book, the book said, the book, many books say there are three types, but when you look at the occurrences of the conditionals in authentic American English, uh, you know, all the three types, occur only half of the whole conditionals. You know what I mean, right? Let's say, let's say, you know, out of 100, uh, if you go to Coca and you randomly select 100 lines containing if clauses, only 50, approximately 50 out of 100 will contain types one, two, and three. 
and the rest will contain some other types that students have never been taught because they are not present in the textbooks, right? And you know, it is it's quite uh, interesting to find that zero conditionals are prevalent. Prevalent, what does it mean prevalent? Uh, very common, right? Prevalent means they are very common, right? See? Uh -huh. Uh, and you know, in second type of conditional, right? You know, when you when you were young, I'm quite sure that this is what your teachers made it apply to you as a student, right? So they would say in E plus type two, always use was not were, right? That that's what the uh, you know uh, conservative or classic grammar references uh, told us told us, right? Don't use was. You have to use were. Uh, no matter what the subject is, right? If I were rich, uh, maybe now I'm not rich. If I were rich, or if I were a bird, now if I were a bird, I would fly, right? But actually, you can, cannot be a bird, right? Or if I were a police officer, I would be very honest, something like that. But actually, you know, it's very likely, it's very unlikely that you will become a police officer, something like that. So, you know, in the old days, we were taught to use were, not was. But nowadays, right, if you look at the corpus data, you can see a lot more use of was rather than were. So you have to change our mindset. Not only should, were, should was possible, uh, you know, it was is possible, right? But you know, was is even uh, more common than were in E plus type two. Uh, I'm going to show with uh, you the data that I collected, right? Uh, this is my, my mini research that I published in 2014, right? This is the time when I went to Buri Lam for the first time in my life, was so excited, exciting, right? I could remember now when I went to Buri Lam for the first time, Ajahn Chukiet now from Faculty of Education came and picked me up, right? He came and picked me up at uh, Buriram Airport, right? Ah, okay. So look at this. I arranged this according to the order of frequency, right? And I turn the frequency into percentage for comparison. So you can see that of all the types here, I found if plus Taiwan to be the most common. But you need, you know, even though they are the most common, it occurs only twenty six point two two percent, followed by zero conditional. Many textbooks fail because they don't include zero conditional, right? If you go back to the classic textbook, they don't even mention zero conditional, even though this is very common, right? Why, why don't you present something that's common? And see, you also have the third one in frequency is present simple plus imperative. For example, if you see John at school, tell them to call me something like that. Now, this is imperative, right? Uh, it's, it's on again, not often found in many textbooks. Type two is the fourth, right? And then you can see that type three, you know, is a waste of time because, you know, many teachers, right? Many high school teachers, many university lecturers, right? We focus too much on type three. But in reality, only 1.83% occurs, see? So, you know, we make it like open our eye, right? We, we try to, uh, you know, uh, make our students remember, right? The third conditional, if I had come, I would have, if he had come, I would have gone. So, you know, when we, when we were young, when I was young, my English teachers, uh, you know, seriously forced me so God, you need to remember, okay, I followed her, right? Which is good, right? But you know, in, in reality, type one is the most common and type three is the least common, right? Yeah, um, okay, I, I might have to say that, right? Uh, my data is not conclusive because, you know, I randomly selected only 200 lines from Coca. Uh, if I increase more data, a clearer picture would be obtained, right? But at least I'd like to show something. So, you know, what seems to be very surprising is, apart from types one, two, three, and zero, you can see mixed type 
So this is something that is quite interesting. Yeah, that and you should take it into your consideration, right? There are mixed types, right? Yeah, something that you would never use it because the textbook never include them. Like, uh, yeah, subject past present simple, and then yeah, this is uh, if clause type one, but the main clause is type two, right? Or even if plus present simple, and then in the if in the main clause you use present progressive or present continuous, they are the same, right? Or you know you can see present perfect. Actually, present perfect is allowed, but uh, no textbook contains present perfect, right? So you know uh, we can see limitations of our grammar textbooks, right? Because the grammar textbooks contains only the three main types. Some some textbooks are good enough to include uh, what zero or even maybe one or two mixed type and that's it right yeah for advanced now I'm using some textbooks some commercial textbooks right and they say okay this is advanced for maybe uh, C1 students right and you know hardly did hardly do they talk about mixed right. So, so you know that's a pity, right? Uh, at least, right? Your your job is not to teach all the mixed type. No, we don't have to because there are many more mixed types than we can teach. But you know what we should do is um, make students aware, raise their awareness, make they become aware that uh, in addition to the three main types, there are also something called zero, which is very common. And that is something that are alternative or mixed types. So, you know, this is to prepare them, right? This is to prepare them. When they, uh, when they use English in, in their everyday life, they would not be shocked or even dumbfounded when they see, uh, you know, this mixture, right? Yeah, at, at least, you know, one day your teachers will become uh, university lecturers or teachers, or maybe they are going to use language uh, in their everyday conversation with uh, daily speakers. And you know, it's likely that they are going to come across this mixed type. So they won't be uh, unprepared. They won't be too shocked, right? Okay. Um, you don't need to test them, right? But just let them know that these types are present in everyday life. That's how. Uh, these are examples. You might be wondering, Right, you might be wondering what examples are, right? So you can take a look at these are the real example from Coca, right? Yeah. Now I, I think everybody would understand if you are on trial, if you are going to see, usually you know, in, in the classic textbook, they never talk about to be going to, right? They just say you have to use will. But why? Why not? Right? This is what I kept wondering when I was a young student, right? Why shouldn't we use are going to, or you know, you can actually use will or won't in the if clause. That's not wrong, right? And so on. Uh, you can also uh, read my paper later on. I, I can I can send the paper to Ajahn Akaraputna, and he can uh, spread. Uh, he can share the paper with you guys. Uh, okay. Should we introduce mixed types to students? My view is that you should, but don't teach them too seriously, right? Please, you should teach the first three classic types plus zero. Why? Because the three classic types, especially the first type, are common and zero is also common. And after the student have learned all the four types, if you know they are interested or you know if they are good students, like students from King classes, you might also mention that there exist mixed types. Right, but don't test them. You know what I mean, right? If you want to put this in test, right, midterm, quiz, uh, final, just test them only the straightforward types, the four types, right? Types one, two, three, and zero, and that's it, right? But at least, you know, you should insist that students use was rather than were. Uh, uh, this is my own question, right? Okay, let me ask you, Ajahn Thoth, I would like you to share. Now, okay, am I not done? In the past, only were, only were is, was correct. In the past, only were was correct in type two. 
was is incorrect, right? But right now, you can see from the corpus data that was is okay and even much more common than were. So as a teacher, as an ELT practitioner, how should you deal with this situation? How? Maybe we can uh, explain why we should we use was and were. So we have we have to differ different differentiate from both verb that uh, it can use both, but right. actually for the classic classical one we we have to use were only. Right. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so very good. Thank you for your viewpoint. Uh, any other opinions from, the, from you? What do you think? I respect all of your viewpoints. There's no right or wrong answer. Should we introduce words or should we strictly follow the old rules of using only word? What do you think? Sir, for my part of view, I think I will present them like a classical one, like a use word, but uh, mention them that every rule will have exception, like we can use words and give them that detail. Right, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Right. So, you know, yeah, I, I agree with both Ajahn's, like both of you, right? And, and I believe that, you know, the other students uh, here in the Zoom who have an answer, maybe you agree with them, right? So. Uh, yeah, maybe you can tell them that uh, were, right, is the preferred form according to the classic rules. But what is also possible or even more common, right? Yeah, uh, it depends, right? Uh, if you are teaching them for test, for example, you are preparing them for get, uh, get, right, or own it, or whatever, right, or tow it, right? You need to uh, make it a point that were is more preferable than was. Yeah, because it strictly follows uh, textbook, grammar textbook. But, right, uh, if I were to teach if clauses, uh, the type two, right, I would say that, okay, both are correct. Both are correct. Was is even more common. You know, uh, right now, if you go to any bookstores, right, or if you buy any grammar books, uh, online or whatever, right? You would be surprised because the explanation is different from when I was a little kid, right? Uh, let, let's say 20 years ago, okay, when I started to teach, right? Yeah, the book say, were is correct and was is not very appropriate, right? Yeah, only were is good, was is bad, right? But right now, the explanation has changed. They say, was is common in everyday use in informal language in spoken word is more formal. See, that's the way they uh, give an explanation to the uh, distinction between the two forms, right? Ah, the last point, right? The last point, okay, is get passive. You know, in English, you know, passive voice, right? Okay, what is the what is the construction of passive voice in English? How can we form passive voice in English? How? Yeah, if you want to write passive voice, passive sentences. Okay, what is the major component of passive sentence, passive voice sentence, or passive constructions? Verb. Verb to be verb to plus be. verb three, yes. Okay, verb to be verb, uh, verb to be plus verb three. Okay, uh, verb three is sometimes known as what? A uh, participle. Past past participle, participle, right? Past participle. Very good, Adana. So you know that's the common way to introduce uh, passive voice to your students, right? But uh, another possibility of passive voice is to use get, right? Yeah, yeah. We often hear right. Yeah, he got kicked out from this. He got injured, got killed, or whatever, right? Uh, traditionally speaking, you know, uh, I, I intentionally cited Hatcher 1949 because, you know, it was quite old, right? Long, long time ago, right? Hatcher, Professor Hatcher said, 
according to old traditional grammar, it was it was uh, it was quite unlikely that the get passive get passive mean the passive construction with get as the verb uh, rather than verb to be would co-occur with human subjects. So when the subject is human, right? Uh, don't use get. Yeah, this is the rule. This was the rule. When, when it was quite unlikely, nah, unlikely mean it seems less probable nah, that uh, the get passive would co-occur with human subjects. Nah, so it means when you have human subjects, don't use it with get. Nah. Okay. Uh, however, corpus data provide counter evidence against this claim or this rule. Okay, now look at the data from concordance slide three. Ah, this one. Okay, look at this uh, data. So leave right now. The rule is that, the rule is that, uh, you know, the rule according to Hatcher 1949, when you use get, nah, uh, the subject is often human. Uh, it's unlikely that get passive would co-occur with human subject. So it means when the subject is human, nah, when the subject is human, uh, don't use get. Nah, that's the rule. Now, nah, when the subject is human, don't use get. Right. Yeah, we use get with uh, inanimate subject or non-human subject. But, you know, look at the data. Look at the corpus data from CanCode. CanCode is another corpus, right? Neighbors who got broken into, neighbor, neighbor is human, right? Neighbor is human. Uh, she got brought up by her grandmother, right? The grandmother brought her up, right? We got burgled. Burger, what does it mean? Burger, you know, name hamburger. Not say hamburger, and hamburger. Burger. This is British word. Uh, when someone, do you know the now burglar, right? B u r g l a. Burglar is a kind of thief, right? Thief male who breaks into one's houses, right? So the verb is burgle or burgle up. This is British. Uh, Americans would say burglarize. See, that's a difference between British and American English. Now, I could have got cane, right? He got called or an idiot. They all got deported. See, all got deported. See, deport means get out, uh, kicked out from a country. He got done. Uh, okay, you got picked up. She got jilted. Jilted means abandoned, right? That's a literary word, right? They got curb crawled, blah, blah, blah. I got, see? So, you know, what you can learn from the data is that the rule is never followed at all right now. The rule says, hey, it's very unlikely to use get passive with uh, human, right? With human. Very unlikely to use get passive with human subject. But see, no one cares about the rule, right? Everyone use get passive with human beings, right? Uh, something that is interesting about the get passive that I'd like to share with you is this one. This is very interesting. From 1.5 million word sample, right? Actually, you know, this is not a big size corpus. Uh, 20 years ago, a corpus, the size of which is 1 million up, was considered large. But right now, only 1.5 million was considered like not a very big corpus, right? But it's good enough for you to study. Okay, I'd like you to see this. These are the verbs to, that are very common to be combined with get in get passive, right? Okay, look at the example first before you read uh, the explanation. What? What have you learned from the verbs here? What do they share in common? Got arrested, got flung about, got killed, got locked in, got lumbered, got picked on, got sued, got burgled, got criticized, got bitten. What do they share in common? Okay. These are common verbs 
that are that appear with gen passive in this corpus, right? Yeah, usually you know we we have learned we need to learn two things. The first thing is that actually gen passive can be used with human subject. So that's the first discovery. The second discovery that you are going to have soon is okay. Get passive. What what is the nature of the get passive meaning? That makes it different from be passive. Be passive is the passive voice with be. Think, think about be passive. Be passive is general. Right? You can use it in general way or in a positive way. Right? Nah. He was complimented. He was uh, like, huh? awarded. Nah. Nah, the book was bought, general, right? Nah, the car was stolen, negative. But look at get passive. Look at the verb. The verb here, huh? what do they share in common? They are all like negative words. Yeah, most of them, right? Most of them. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if we look at the examples here, we can say they are all negative, right? But, but you know, when you look at the whole data, you can see some... Uh, neutral, right? So here, uh, you we often use get passive in adversative context. And uh, this is the term. Adversative means unpleasant, undesirable, unfortunate, problematic, right? So, uh, so at least, right? We should we should be aware that uh, not only should we use get passive, right? Uh, with you know, it's not it's not always the same in meaning as be passive. Because get passive, it would be very strange or weird if you use get passive in a positive way. Right? You, you can, but it's not very common. Except got paid, right? You got paid, right? Yeah, I mean, every uh, by the end of each month, you will get paid, right? By your boss, by your company you are working for, right? Uh, you can get awarded, that's okay. But you know, if you look at the whole data from any corpus, right, you can see that get passive is often uh, convey negative meanings. So this is something that you should recognize. Yeah. Get intimidated. What does it mean, intimidated? Get intimidated. Yeah. Like frightened? Frightened. Very good. I get frightened, right? Intimidated is like you are frightened or you you are made to fear something, right? Okay. Lumbered. Uh, this is quite uh, an infrequent word. Landed with unpleasant job. Okay. So uh, this is the uh, conclusion, right? From the can code data of all 139 type A, you don't, you don't have to understand what type A or type B, whatever, right? Of all 139 get passive, right? That I showed you up to 124. So I think this is more than 80%, 80 right? Are used in adversative context. So it means that most of the get passive examples are used in, you know, unfortunate context or undesirable context. Okay, now, so this is something that you should learn. With our corpus data, maybe making an observation is difficult, right? Yeah, you need to, maybe you need to use a lot more experience. You have to be exposed more to English language that people in everyday use life, uh, like uh, you, people use in their everyday life. But now with the advent of corpus uh, technology, you can you can broaden your horizons, right? I, I think today you have learned something, right? About uh, you know, it's like this is a uh, eye-opening experience for you, Nakab, and you can revisit uh, teaching grammar and vocabulary. But but actually, you can use corpus linguistic uh, to any other uh, points like pragmatics, discourse analysis as well. Um, and so on and so forth, right? Okay, uh, for researchers, right? As I showed, right? You can use existing corpora. You, you, you can choose, you, you can use existing corpora. Existing corpora mean they are ready-made corpora and you can just use it for free, 
or buy it นะ BNC Coca I, I just look at Coca right uh, it's like ท่าไหร thirty thirty USD per per year right per 12 months so so that's like 1059 baht now that that's not not too expensive now and if you buy it two year it would be a bit cheaper right uh you know if you are if you want to study uh the learner errors you can use tlic right but this is an old corpus and you know the corpus has not been updated right thai learner english corpus by dr virod arun manakun at the faculty of arts jula longkorn university uh you you can uh, develop your specialized corp corpora this is if you want to teach esp right maybe you know you you may want to uh write a textbook right english for lawyers english for advertisement english for uh architects something like that maybe you know writing a textbook uh based on the special language right yeah on the text in that particular field would be beneficial, right? And you can use some corpus software like Ankong, Monokong, Wordsmith, right? Uh, you, I, uh, sorry, we don't have enough time today to talk about them, right? Uh, Ankong is free, the other is not, right? But but you know actually they 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 work very similar, right? You can um, go to a workshop, right? That actually, you know, there are free online webinars or workshop teaching you how to use these software programs. So uh, you can also uh, benefit from these, right? Okay, so conclusion, right? Yeah, before I give you time for Q&A, right? Language Corpora can widen language users, researchers, and teachers' knowledge. So we are language users. We are also researchers. We are teachers. So it's like we are three in one, right? So uh, I think you can, you can benefit a lot from language corpora for your own classroom, for your materials development, and also for your research, right? You, you can collect the data from uh, using your own, uh, build, to build your own corpus. Or you can use existing corpora. You know, I have been conducting a lot of research studies using COCA, using BNC, and that works a lot, right? Uh, you can do something like mini research project, right? Or you can do a big project for your PhD thesis, right? So it's up to you, right? You can do a small project for your uh, maybe assistant professorship, associate professorship, right? Um, you know, you are in the game, right? You are in, you know, at uh, in Thailand, right? If you are a university lecturer, you are expected to, you know, get promoted, right? Or get tenure, right? By uh, acquiring uh, assistant professorship, associate professorship, for instance, right? So, language corpora, shed lights on, uh, shed lights, uh, shed lights on discovery of some new aspects or unexplored areas in the language that we are learning or researching. So it helped you get to know something that you haven't known before, right? Okay, right, okay. Uh, okay, I stopped sharing, right? Oh, Ajapisha tried to answer, sorry, I didn't see that. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go back to maybe Coca. I, I want to show another example, right? Oh, sorry, I have to stop, stop sharing this and okay, I share, share it again. Okay, so you can see Koka, right? How about this verb cause and make cause? Okay, cause. Oops, sorry, list. Right. See? Oh, but here, you know, this is a mix between cause as a verb and cause as a noun. Ah, cause, ah, long, but come here, it's a verb. Okay, so. What have you learned 
or maybe you might not like the idea of uh, the presentation of the keyword in context in Coca because the words are not presenting like, you know, in the same column, right? But, you know, at least they highlight the search word for us, right? Okay, what have you learned about the verb cause? You know, usually some students ask me, Ajahn Krab, uh, cause, can, can, I, can I always use cause to mean make? You know, some students, some undergrad students, they, they know that make someone do something cause someone to do something. They can notice the grammatical difference or the grammatical patterns that are different between these two verbs. But actually, the underlying meaning of these two verbs also differ, right? Look at the first one, cause the rupture. Cause us to feel the excitement of children. The pain caused by pain, caused by. Cause more misery. Cause landslide, landslide if you didn't tell them, huh? Cause Alzheimer disease and related dementia. Cause a stir, nah? cause, cause bisexual abuse. Cause them to be cautious, okay, that's different. Brain damage, caused by vaccine, oh, that's uh, scary. Diabetes is caused by parasite. Cause extensive, extensive damage. Okay, look at only the first 10 lines. What have you learned about the verb cause? Look, uh, pay attention to the, the now, the object now of the verb cause. Cause rupture. Rupture means complex lie, right? Cause misery. Misery means sadness. Bad luck. Cause Alzheimer's disease. Cause landslide. Cause damage. Cause uh, diabetes. No, my one. So, what have you learned from the verb cause? Hmm. It is. Effect. Anyone um, would like to try? Uh, I have learned that uh, for the word cause, right? It acts like the passive verb. It, it could be either active or passive, right? Okay, it could be either active or passive. You can see when we say cause by, that passive. But you can see a lot more examples where cause is followed by object. I like you to pay attention to the meaning. Usually cause like the bad effect. Right, cause is followed by something bad, right? Cause will follow by some negative thing, right? Like bad effect or something like that, see? So, you know, uh, verb like cause, the now like consequence, these are two classic examples that we often use to teach the sense of words uh, in English, right? The word itself is neutral, but when it is used in context, it carries with them either positive or negative sense, sometimes negative, right? See? Okay. Uh, let me recap today. So we looked at the definition of corpus linguistics, right? Uh, I show you uh, some corpus uh, example, the free one, right? BNC, uh, POCA, right? And how to search the words, right? We, we know how to search the words, looking for frequency, looking at the distribution of the words across genres or text types, right? We look at uh, how, how the words can differ in the degree of formality, right? Like in the word, uh, yeah. uh, all the examples that we looked at, now, allow, let, for example, right? And after the break, we look at the three uh, interesting grammatical areas, namely contractions, get passive, and conditionals. And we have learned that what has been put in the rules are no longer uh, conformed to, right? Even native speakers, they do not strictly follow the rules, right? So we have to reconsider the way we teach English and the way we do research. Right, uh, believe me, right, you can apply. I hope that you guys can apply the knowledge of corpus linguistic to your own research and of course to your own uh, teaching, right? Okay, so now I think, you know, we have like 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Chen uh, Kao. Yes, professor. Yes. 
uh, if, if you are interested in corpus research in ELT, so which aspect that we should consider apart from the vocabulary aspect? So can we use uh, like reading or listening or uh, writing? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. You, can you, you can give use me some it. example? Yeah, yeah, you can use it for, for all kinds of uh, skill teaching, right? For example, if you are teaching reading, right? You, you can also uh, get some text, right? Get some text uh, to help the student read or maybe you can prepare them, prepare them. You know, uh, one thing that we think about uh, teaching reading is vocabulary because the student need to know vocabulary so that they can read successfully, right? So maybe you can prepare them with uh, some, you know, basic vocabulary in the field, right? Or you can create word list. Uh, you know, for example, some students of mine, they created the word list for high school students, right? And make sure that, you know, if the student can be uh, introduced to this word list, right? They are going to be successful in their exam, in their learning at the level or something like that, right? Okay. Yeah, it, it, it might not be applied to reading directly, right? Because, you know, uh, it's going to be something like concordance slide, but you can use it for your research. For example, if you want to study uh, spoken language, right? You, you, may, you may study some uh, idiomatic expressions that are very common in spoken. Yeah, for example, uh, some students uh, looked at uh, the, oh, yeah, a very good example. I think Ajahn Sia, you know Ajahn Sia, right? Panupan, he is your... Yeah, he's mm, my colleague. Right? colleague. Yeah, your he's colleague, right? Program. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. He's very good at corpus linguistic and, you know, I appreciate his effort in conducting his research, right? He looked at TV series called... Uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, yeah, maybe it's about doctors, <laughs> right? About okay. yeah, and you know there are a lot of conversations between doctors and patients, right? And you know, yeah, he collected the data, even though the data is not one hundred percent authentic, right? It's very interesting because you know you can learn some useful expressions, yeah, that you know doctors often use, right? Or patients often use, right? So they have like you know their linguistic patterns. Right, something like that. This is just an example. Or maybe, you know, if you want to know uh, how to give very good, how to give speech effectively, let's say, you know, one day, Ajahn was someone you are assigned to teach public speaking, right? Yeah, so you need to know, right, what are the common expressions that, uh, you know, good speakers often use? How do they introduce their speech? Uh, how do they change the topic? Or maybe what are the what are the string of words? This is called lexical bundles. What are the string of words that people often use, right? You know, think about this. Think, think about uh, everyday use, right? Uh, when you go into a restaurant, right? Uh, or or, or let's, let's say when you go to uh, a shop, right? The shop assistant would ask you, uh, what can I do for you, right? Uh, can I do you a favor, something like that? Okay, so these are very common expressions that are specific to some particular situations, right? Yeah, you can, you can, you can yeah. also develop some materials to teach speaking, right? Okay. Listening as well, right? Okay. So it depends on our subject or population, right? Right, or your purpose, right? Okay. Of doing research or of your teaching. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Kap. So any other example, any other uh, questions? Turn up, Kap. Maybe you can, you can conduct research, right? Anything that you are interested in, in, you know, in the area, everything, right? Everything, yeah. Corpus linguistic is like a tool. It's just a tool. You, you can apply it to any, any kind of thing. For example, if you are teaching English for advertisement, maybe you want to uh, look at how, how, how uh, companies advertise their products, right? What are strategies of advertising their product? Maybe you can ask them, you can ask the pro, collect the data, right, of, you know, cosmetic products in English in the world, right? And then ask the program to find the frequency list. Right, so you can see, oh, what are the words that are the most frequent? Maybe you can see the word like you, right? You is the most frequent, what does it mean? 
yeah, it focuses on the customer, right? Or it focuses on the adjective like best or now, right? Yeah, now, nah. beauty now, cute now, because people don't want to wait something like that. So you can analyze, right? Um, some of my former students did a very good, uh, uh, Nalin, nah. I think 10 years ago, right? She did a very interesting uh, study on political discourse, right? News discourse, because at that time, you know, in Thailand, there were two leading newspapers. What are they? What were they? Bangkok Post and... Bangkok Post and... Nation. The nation. The nation, very good. Yeah. Bangkok Post and the nation. And at that time, you know, they published the uh, paper, newspaper called Yadim yeah. Nam. And also we have our student week. <laughs> yeah, you have student weekly, right? But that's, you know, th that's very good. I love that, that you know the language is simplified, right? Uh, you know, uh, back of course, at that time, you know, there was like protest against the government. Yeah, red shirt, yellow shirt, something like that. And, you know, even though the nation and back of course present the same news on the same date, the same activities of the protest, the way they present are uh, different and they show political biases, right? Through the word they use, for example, I, I'm not so sure at that time, maybe the nation uh, was like red shirt, pro red, no, no, yellow shirt, right? Oh no, uh, she Nalinena compared the use of words uh, in New York Times and Bangkok Post. And she found that New York Times at that New York Times, not in the United States, they supported the protest. They supported the red, red, red shirt protesters, right? Yeah, because you know, when the red shirt got injured, they say, uh, these uh, democracy lover, democracy lover uh, got wounded, W or wounded, wounded, what does it mean wounded? Rather than the word, okay, let me type it for you, wounded. Rather than the word injured, they are synonyms, but they, they have different senses. This is a very interesting uh, example, right? But you know, when uh, Bangkok Post, at that time, when Bangkok Post presented the news, they just say, okay, this protester, they call them protester, this protester got injured. Got injured is just general, right? Now, when you attend, when, when you join, a mob, right? When you join a protest, you could get injured, right? By anything, right? But wounded, it has some implication. Wounded means you got injured by some weapons. Yeah. And the weapons are from the police, something like that. See? So, you know, the use of words can imply some political biases. So, that's just, uh, you know, a part of it. So, you can use this for uh, this cost study, right? Okay, so so you know, I wish I had more time, but actually you can you can explore. Uh, one book, oh, I, I, I left it at home. It's called uh, Corpus Linguistic for ELT. Yeah, by Ivor Timmis, two thousand fifteen. Right. Yeah, that's a very good book. Right, that's a very good book to start with. Okay. Uh, it is classic, and it shows you how you can. Uh, first, it shows you the basics of corpus linguistic and how you can apply it to your teaching. Okay. Actually, there are many others, right? But in order not to confuse you, I would suggest that you start with that one. Uh, 2015, not too old, right? Okay. Ah, I think. Any question yes. from our beloved participants? Not just only batch two, not about batch one students. We have six minutes left. <laughs> Unfortunately, time flies, Professor. Actually, you know, I thank you, Ajahn Akrapun, again for inviting me. Actually, you know, I had a class on Saturday, right? But today is the first week. So I finally, I cancel the class. Ajahn, no worry, right? I cancel the class. And, and you know, I make, up it, make it up later. This afternoon, I'm going to teach an MA class in Corpus Linguistics. Right, so it's like uh, I'm, I might be a bit confused, right? Because I'm teaching the same thing, but but uh, different, right? Uh, slides, okay. So so I hope you can apply the knowledge of 
uh, you know, corpus linguistics to your teaching and to your research, right? And, you know, if you have any questions uh, later on about this, feel free to contact me, right? You can, you can email me, right? Ajahn uh, Akrapun has my email, right? Or you can even add me on Facebook, right? Uh, and so that, you know, you can keep abreast of what I'm doing. Okay. Right, I think there is no uh, questions at all right now. So, um, may I invite uh, the Dean of Musok uh, and the Chair of uh, ELT program uh, to the uh, closing room, please. Okay, thank you very so much for your very insightful uh, lecture today. As I said, Professor Dr. Supakan, I really appreciate your li lively talk. You always like this. You are very professional uh, uh, speakers, all right? I, I would say that you are the rising star of uh, ELT in Thailand, I would say, all right? Now, it's just a life in my hometown. I belong to Bengkan. But uh, fortunately, uh, internet Wi-Fi is still okay. Uh, now I'm 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 sat uh, I'm sitting among my 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 relatives in remote area, and uh, uh, all the way to my hometown while driving, I I, I keep listening to uh, lectures given by Professor Supercon. Very interesting in indeed, in and also all participants. Uh, uh they energetically participate in this thank thank you so much for your active uh participation and i'm very certain that in the near future we are going to have uh, professor supergon with us in person at OBU campus very soon all right and, <laughs> and if uh little also uh little language institute thomas university also uh always uh, for the webinar and i uh, done uh, spoke on very kind and keep sending me the webinar links and, and ask me to forward to all of you. Thank you so much for your kindness, sir. And we will keep in touch and keep our academic uh, cooperation. All right. So, so uh, on behalf of uh, BIU, uh, Hillsock faculty and the PhD in UT program, I would like to thank you very so much, Opera Spence, for your initiative participation in this webinar. And at the end of this webinar, please join me in giving a big round of applause to our uh, invited speakers, Associate Professor Dr. Supergon Poo Thank you very Thank so much for your Thank you very much, uh, contribution, Thank you. sir. So uh, last but not least, please allow me to declare uh, the webinar uh, officially closed. See you next time. Stay healthy and keep in touch. Thank you very so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.